Hey, what's up, guys? This is Pastor Scott, and we're just so thankful that you chose to be with us online or on live stream. And, and we hope you are encouraged. We hope you're convicted. Uh, but we also hope that you grow closer to Jesus, because that's our main goal. But doing this, it does cost us money. And so uh, if you consider this your home church online, um, or you're just checking us out, if you would be led by the Spirit to give us a gift, then we'd appreciate it. But I want to make it also very clear that if this was just sent to you by a friend, or, or you just listen to us sometimes, please just give to your home church. We never want to take um, the finances and the resources that people need at your church. And so please, just give to your home church, and uh, we'll gladly just inspire you with these messages. Um, but if you would like to give us a gift, you can go on our app, or you can go on our website, and uh, you can give online. So again, thank you so much. We love you, and we hope that you grow closer to Jesus through this. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. Today is a really special day. I already had an awesome service at 8.30, and uh, believe in big things for this service and the next one as well. Um, we're, we're a church that we do love Easter. Easter was amazing. We are so thankful for what God did at Easter in that event. Um, two different services at the same time, one downtown, or one in, at the Adams Center, one down in Hamilton. Both were just packed out, and a lot of people got to meet Jesus uh, for the first time. And so I, I just want to say thank you to all you volunteers who helped out in both spots. Like, that is no small task to do that. So thank you guys so much. And also, I just want to uh, give my, my little bro Kyle some love because he did an amazing job. So give Kyle a hand for how awesome he did. It was an amazing weekend between uh, the service downtown that we did for the Lord's Supper and uh, then Good Friday, then leading up to Easter. It was just incredible. But again, we're a church that we want to celebrate those occasions, and, and those are awesome, awesome moments for our church, but we are also a forward-moving church. Paul always says, put the former things behind you and press on towards the goal. And so we believe that we do this every single week at Zootown Church. Uh, we don't want this just to be an event-type mentality uh, because we believe every single week people get to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we do. If you're new with us from Easter, that's what we do every week. We talk about this book that God gave us, and we talk about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I'm starting a new series today, and I kind of have to intro this a little bit. Um, and, and, and I just want to share a story with you that happened to me that was just so intimate in my life. And this actually happened um, probably like six years ago when we were still downtown. Um, and our, our church is at the coffee shop, and our church had just started to grow. Um, it was doing pretty good, and then we just kind of turned a corner, but, you know, we didn't, still didn't have a lot of staff and, and a lot of people who were volunteering, so I had to brunt a lot of that burden. Um, not only that is we're running a, a full-time business, a coffee shop, and a church, and uh, I was working 60-plus hours every week, and I had a brand-new little baby named Lily. Now, it, of course, you love your kids, and it was such an awesome moment to have Lily, uh, but the Lord decided to give her the spiritual gift of not sleeping, uh, so that was awesome, and she really did, I mean, no joke, for years and years she didn't sleep, she had terrible colic, couldn't figure it out, and then she went right into night terrors, and it was just a really hard time in life, because then me and my wife aren't sleeping, so I'm just being honest with you, as, that, the, as the momentum turned in the church, I wasn't doing good, I, I was doing pretty poor, both spiritually, physically, uh, mentally you name it, is, is it was a tough time in my life. And I mean, not only that, as I remember, like, you know, at the coffee shop, I had this little office that was behind the stage, and that's where the drums are, uh, and that's where I would do my studies, but also kind of bounce back and forth behind the bar and make coffee. Um, but, but again, I, I was so tired most days that I was back there, and, and I always struggled because then the young college kids would come in, and they'd say to me how tired they were. And I'd just look at them like, <laughs> ah! you know, pull their heart out, because it was, it was, you know, just like, come on, man, no offense, but until you have kids and all that stuff, you don't even know what tired is, uh, and so they'd be like, will you pray for me, and I just want to be like, will you pray for me, because like, I'm all messed up, but I was in a bad spot, because I was working so much, and then I would go home, and it was a house full of tension, but, but and I'm an honest preacher, because I got to tell you, like, preachers feel like they can't be vulnerable, um, because it, if, we're, if we're vulnerable, then, then people will think we're weak, and so honestly, I was acting like this, this is the face I was putting on, um, um, was this, <laughs> but I felt like this, <laughs> like I was just really confused and, and really hurting a lot, and uh, every day I would sit and I would spend some time with Jesus, and I always prayed to Jesus, that's who I thought you prayed to, because you know, in Jesus' name and all that, and I love praying to Jesus, Jesus is awesome, 
But I kid you not, I had this amazing moment. This is one of the most real moments I've ever had in my walks with the Lord. As, as I'm praying to Jesus, when I say praying, I mean weeping and crying and grumbling. I seriously heard him say, you know what, Scotty? I love talking to you. But right now, you need a father. And it was like this moment in this office downtown where I, almost, I felt like Jesus like, turned around and said, let me introduce you to my father. It was real. And I was weeping, and like, I, you know, I didn't have a father. My dad died when, he, when I was 22, and your father's important in your life for guidance, for strength, for comfort. I mean, and I didn't have that. And to be honest with you, I was always afraid to pray to the father. I never thought about praying to the father. Because the father's kind of scary, especially the Old Testament guy. And Jesus is cool, right? I can pray to Jesus. He's cool. He's always healing people. Like, he's doing miracles. And, like, he's just this loving, awesome guy. And then the Holy Spirit, I mean, the Holy Spirit's awesome because it describes him like the wind. So it's just kind of this mysterious thing. You know, I like him. But then there's the Father. And that was a hard one for me. And it's a hard one for a lot of you in here today because I just got to be honest with you. And, again, this hits home hard. Is I've always felt like the Father was just tolerating me. Like, he didn't really want to be around me. He, uh, you know, because that's how we picture him, right? Like, the Father's in heaven, and, and Jesus came to appease the Father, because we hear that all the time. And the Father's just standing there up there like this, like, oh, yeah, Jesus, just go do your thing. And, and I, I felt like he didn't want to talk to me. I definitely felt like the Father didn't like me. And so really the Father was just kind of tolerating me until I'm perfected someday. And, and then when I get to heaven, then he'll love me because then I've got more sin in my life. And it just, it, it's a weird view how we view the Father, but it's, it's real. It's a real thing. I was reading this article um, a while back, but it was talking about the nation of Islam. Like why so many young black men are choosing the nation of Islam, especially in cities like Detroit um, and Chicago and those types of places. And, and, and they attribute it to the fatherless home. And really, all of us humans, we do want structure. We say we are our own thing. We say we want chaos. But really, we like structure. There's a structure to our life that we like. And what the Nation of Islam has done is it has allowed these young black men to be, have a father figure. And it's also allowed them to have a structure to their life. But it's also allowed them to keep their anger towards everybody else. But I think, again, and as I've read some other articles, we, we judge them. And, and we always say this about, you know, the, the African-American culture, about their fatherlessness. They say there's just as many white fatherless homes. And that's a lie. That, that is just the black community. And they also say there's a ton of fatherless homes now in America due to prosperity. Meaning us Americans, we really, really, we tout how much we work. And we think that that's a good thing. And so now there's a ton of homes where the father is working 50 plus hours a week. It's all about money. It's all about prosperity. And then they come home and they're just the disciplinarians. What kind of view of dad is that? So this isn't just a black thing. This is a white thing. This is a human thing. This is a nation thing that we're all kind of longing for this father. Now, what I see about Jesus, though, is yes, Jesus came to defeat sin. Jesus came to defeat death. But I am convinced now, as I've been on this journey over and over and over in the word of God, Jesus came to show us who the father is. And we've neglected this in Christianity. I've neglected this because we have a really, really, really terrible view of the father. See, the scriptures say that, yeah, like Jesus came, he died for our sins, all that stuff. But it also says like him and the father are one. So if you want to know who the father is, then you have to look at Jesus. And if we look at Jesus as a father, he's pretty stinking awesome. And I just see him as, as we see this progress in the Bible. The Bible is a progression of understanding who God is. You don't know who he is fully in Genesis. You don't know him fully in all the Old Testament. You know him fully through the person of Jesus. And so we're allowed to know these names of God. And the first one was Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is our provider. Which meant before the law, before Moses, before the rules, he said, I will provide the covering of your sin. He was always a forgiver. And so we get all these names and all these names. But then Jesus comes along. And Jesus gives us the final name of who God, what he wants to be called. And this is why, again, I meet you on this level, but this thing in society that says, you know, he's a higher power and all that stuff. Like, okay, if that's how you got to meet him first, that's okay. But that's not who he is. Because Jesus gave us one ultimate name for who, thought, who he wants us to call him. And it wasn't even just father. He says, Abba, father, which means daddy. Daddy is what he wants to be called. 
And that's an incredibly intimate name that, again, we have totally kind of messed up in our society. But how intimate is it that the God of the universe wants all of us to call him Daddy? Again, that's hard for me. That's hard for me to say that. Because, we, you know, we were taught like we have to have a reverence for the Lord, a fear of the Lord. And Daddy and fear, I mean, that just, that just doesn't go. You know, it's kind of like when your mom would say, wait till your father gets home. Like, I'd be like, how about you just kill me now, you know, before he gets here? <laughs> So that's hard. And then Jesus, though, this is why it's so important. Think about the Lord's Prayer. He gives us the Lord's Prayer. We're supposed to say this every day as a reminder, and not just repeat it, but as a template. How does he start out the Lord's Prayer? He says, our Father, our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be his name. That word hallowed means set apart. It means holy. What he's saying to us is the word daddy is a holy name that you and me need to be reminding ourselves of daily. It's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. But here's the problem. We all had flawed fathers, and I'm a flawed father. And we constantly, some of you had really, really, really bad dads. And so we are constantly equating the father on earth to the father in heaven, and so this makes some of you even uncomfortable right now, and I, I understand that. I meet you there. I, I understand. I'm sorry. And so that's why we really, really struggle with the father in heaven a lot. I had a great dad. Um, wasn't perfect by any means, but I can tell you that my dad was a generous guy. He was a kind guy. He was a gentle guy. But the problem is, is me and my father never talked about anything important. We talked about sports and hunting, just surface level stuff. He never taught me one spiritual thing in life. And so I believe that as I became a Christian when I was 22 and we were talking about the father, I never thought I could even go to my father for that stuff because I never went to my father for that stuff. This is why in that book, The Shack, a lot of people missed it. They grew, Christians got real upset that in that book they made God a black woman named Papa. And they freaked out and they boycotted it and all that. And you missed the main point. The reason why is the main character, Mac, had an abusive father, a terrible dad. And he didn't feel like he was ready to meet a dad, so he met a woman named Papa. And at the end of that book, he became a father, a male. Again, I thought it was genius. I thought it was genius that he would do that in that book. Because how many people have been abused by their fathers and hurt by their fathers? And so we struggle with the Heavenly Father. So I say all this because I have been on this like six month to a year to lifetime journey of understanding the Father better. And the reason I haven't been able to preach, I've never preached on the Father. You know why I haven't been able to preach on it? I haven't felt it. A lot of preachers can fake it. They can just give you facts and all that stuff. Get a nice polished sermon for you today. But I haven't felt it. And I do now. I feel it. And with all the chaos in the world, and with all the strife, and all the fighting, and everything that's going on, and you have refugees trying to find a home everywhere all over the world, and you have all this political unrest, as I have been meeting with the Father more and more, the Father said to me, Scotty, right now, what people really need is a dad. And so I'm going to introduce our church to the Father. And I'm going to go through a list of things that he is. Um, so you can understand him better, but so you can understand yourself better. And so I decided what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start from the very beginning. I'm going to look at Father, your creator. That you are not just some random chance and accident. That you are not just some blip in time. That you are not just something that went, and then over time it kind of you know, grew. Again. I mean, how does that help you? I don't understand how people can live with that. How does that help you live? And we live in a world where everyone's trying to be unique. Everyone wants to stand out. And you will never stand out more than when you know you are a uniquely made creation in the eyes of a father. That's how you will know how unique you are. And so we're actually going to look at the creation account. And again, there's a lot that goes to this, but I'm just going to focus on him making man. Um, but there, there's two sides to this. Like a lot of people are now trying to say that that creation count is poetry and all that stuff. And, and I, I, don't, I think it's important, but I don't think it equals your salvation if you believe it. But I always say, why would you not want to believe it? Because Jesus Christ talked about Genesis a lot. He mentioned Adam and Eve as the first created beings. He mentioned them as the first married couple. He mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah. He mentioned Abel as the first martyr. Like, it was a real historical figure. But on the other side of it is I can give you, I'll, see, I'm into it, man. I'm into archaeology. I love uh, reading the Institute of Creation Research stuff. I can give you fact after fact after fact. But those facts probably won't help you today in 2018 live a better life, right? 
So I want to introduce you to the real thing, the real story behind it, because Jesus did talk in parables a ton. But I want to tell you that those genealogies, if you have read your Bible and there's a list of a ton of names that you can't even pronounce and you're thinking, why am I even reading this list of names? Those genealogies matter because they prove that Jesus was the Messiah in the line of David. And I think we know genealogies matter because some of you love Ancestry.com. It's blowing up. Everyone wants to know where they come from. And now we can do that. So it is important to us. So here's the deal. I heard a great quote. This guy said, sometimes Christians are more, are, are, are more passionate about facts than fruit. We want to know the facts of things. And we miss the fruit of things. So yes, I 100% believe the Genesis count. You should too. You're missing Jesus if you don't. But also, if you don't believe it, you're going to miss this little nugget of truth that's in there. Because in Luke 3.23... It says, Jesus was known as the son of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Heli. Don't even know if you say it that way. All the way down the line. So he goes through the list. His whole genealogy goes to 38, or verse 38. Enosh was the son of Seth. Seth was the son of Adam. And Adam was the son of God. Here's why this is important. Adam is not some fictional Hebrew poetry made up guy. He's in the list of genealogies of Jesus Christ. But what's really important is that what God wanted us to know from the very beginning is that he was a father. Because in that genealogy it says, Adam was the son of God. That's cool stuff if you, if you really look at it. He wasn't some random animal. He wasn't some blip. He wasn't some made up thing. He was an intimate son with the father. And so what the whole point of all the universe and the greatest story ever is that we are these uniquely designed sons and daughters that God spoke life into. That will change everything how you view yourself. That will change everything how you view your world because everyone is made in the image of God. And that's why as a church, the big C church, we should denounce any form of racism, any form of bigotry, any form of prejudice in our world because we are all made in the image of God. But look at this. This is an amazing passage. It says, Genesis 2. So God creates the earth. God creates the universe. It's an amazing thing. People ask me if I believe in the Big Bang. Absolutely. Because when God spoke the world into existence, you bet there was a loud bang. In verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils. And the man became a living person. Now, again, I want to show you the Father's heart. I want you to get into this and understand this because this isn't just some God being like, Bleh. he's a father. He's a father. And what father isn't, doesn't have crazy extreme joy and excitement when his first child comes? I remember my little lily bug, man. She was, you know, we weren't really expecting her. And we weren't expecting her to come so early either. And we went in for a random checkup. I mean, it was like six weeks before my wife was supposed to give birth. And uh, the doctor comes in and he says, he kind of looks at her a little bit. And my wife actually had this condition where she fills up with water. So it like filled up her body with water. And it's dangerous because your brain starts swelling. And I use that against her all the time, by the way. Uh, but <laughs> the doctor comes in and says, well, we're going to have this baby today. And I'm like, What? Like, I don't have our clothes. I don't have anything. He's like, no, in a couple hours, we're going to have this baby. So, I mean, it's just talk about the chaos. Talk about the shock. Talk about, like, this confusion that's going on. And I'll never, you know, we go in and, and the, you know, every, it's just so much going on. And the doctor's like, do you want an epidural? And I'm like, you darn right I want an epidural. <laughs> And he's like, no, your wife. And you know, you know, I love modern medicine. Modern medicine's amazing. I hate when Christians poke fun at modern medicine. Now, if you're into natural birth, I'm not dogging you. But when they said, do you want an epidural? My wife was like, woo, woo. <laughs> but then you have this crazy moment. Like this thing comes out and you don't know how to feel. But you know you would do anything for that kid right there and then. And I was, dude, when I saw it was a girl, I'm like, what guns am I going to buy to protect this thing? Because it's like you instantly have a connection. You instantly fall in love with this thing. And then remember the first little tar diaper poop that you have? You're like, I looked at my wife like, what did you eat for nine months that she's <laughs> pooping tar? <laughs> doctor had to explain it's a natural thing. But I thought I had to give birth to a dinosaur. <laughs> like, it was super weird. <laughs> 
but all this new stuff, right? But think about the excitement. Think about the love. Think about the joy that you have in that moment. My mom told me that when I was about to be born, they didn't know what I was going to be. And uh, my dad, he's, you know, athlete and all that. He really wanted a son. And literally, when I was born, I was, four, I was premature, way premature. I was a sick kid, had to go to the incubator, all that stuff. Like, I uh, <laughs> weighed four pounds, 22 inches long. My mom said I was a noodle. I was just one big <laughs> noodle. And uh, my dad was so excited when he saw that it was a boy, he ran and jumped over the bed and like got, was so excited that he was having a son. And I think about how we are sinful and we are skewed and we are selfish. And if we can get that excited in this moment, how much more the Father in heaven? How much more than dad? Think about how awesome this moment is. This isn't some blob of dirt like we've always thought. That, again, God was just like, with no feeling behind it. He was intricately making this. He was an artist. He was putting this together. This is why when people say that they think this was all just a random chance and accident, I'm like, your lungs, your heart, your eyes, that stuff is so crazy complex. I don't know how you can believe that. And God sat there and he fashioned the heart. He fashioned the kidneys. He fashioned everything. And then he made the brain. And as he makes this brain, he's so creative that he gives this, this capability of memory. And then he breathes life into Adam. And Adam's first memory, as he opens his eyes, was his father's face and his father's voice. Talk about an intimate moment. Talk about a crazy, creative, awesome, special moment. Jesus quoted Genesis a lot. It's a real story. But he also quoted more than any other book, he quoted the Psalms. And in the Psalms, they constantly affirm the creation account. But my favorite Psalm is David in 139, when it says, You made all the de delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. This is before microscopes. This is before science. And they already recognize, like, holy cow, this is, this is a pretty complex thing. Your worksmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me? Stop there. How precious are Father's thoughts about you? And we don't feel it, right? We don't feel that. But he says it. He's precious. You are precious to him. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. David was a huge sinner, you guys. A huge sinner. He made so many mistakes, and they're all recorded in a book. Thank God God didn't write a book about my life. And he wrote this in the midst of some super hard times in his life. And he's still saying, man, my father loves me. And I want you to know, with all your sin and all your pain and all your hurt, think about how many times you've thought negatively about God. Think about how many times you've thought terribly about the father. Because sin's a liar. Sin lies to you about who you are and about who God is. And even after all those moments, Father's thoughts are still precious for you. Again, we've been taught in Christianity that Father's just up there like, oh, yeah, well, just go get him, Jesus. Go get him and, you know, whatever. Go get him. He's not like that. He's sitting there thinking, even in these crazy sins that we do, he's just like, I love them. That's so different than we've been taught. I love what one man writes about this moment. There's a long quote, but think about how amazing this creation. Again, we just read this creation account like, oh, that's pretty cool. I'm like, no, this is crazy deep. Father's love brought Adam to life. With respect to the other created beings, God needed only to speak a word, and they came into being from nothing. However, in the case of Adam, the father had to come down, scoop some earthly mud, and begin to fashion Adam into his own image and likeness. The Father took special care in creating Adam. In all of human experiences, there is nothing that can compare to the very moment God breathed life into Adam. 
In that instance, Holy Father gave life to humanity for the first time, and this moment captures the very purpose and essence of man's existence. Mankind exists for, by, and through him who is love and who is our Father. In the moment of creation, Adam experienced the first of first. He heard the first voice, his father's voice. He saw the first face, the glorious face of his father. He felt the first touch, the touch of his father. I mean, this is such an intimate account. His first emotion was awakened to response to the love of the father. His whole being came alive because of love. And what was likely the first word that came out of Adam's mouth? Yes, it was Abba, Father. With divine spontaneity, he responded to his father's love and embrace as a son. From the very beginning, mankind was created for this kind of encounter, face to face with Father God. Every fiber of our being aches for this. Humanity has been wired for divine encounters with the heavenly family, Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is nothing on this earth that could satisfy this longing for the father's love and embrace. This is why when people say that there's been no side effects to not believing in God and, and all this other stuff, there has absolutely been side effects because it has made us lost children from not knowing our Father. And here's the cool thing. Father, he, uh, saw all, all creation saw that it was good, but he also knew that Adam needed some helpmates. So he created a bunch of animals. Now, you who love animals, I'm all for it. I'm not an animal lover, but God put that in you. Take care of the animals, take care of the earth. That's an important thing. But it still doesn't fully connect like a human being. We try to think that now. I mean, you know, because a lot of people are lonely and a lot of people are struggling and so they make animals as their substitute. But, and that's okay. But it, God knew it was never the right full picture. So God decided to create his masterpiece when he created woman. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from, this, from his rib and he brought her to the man. He brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one, but one is my bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. That sounds amazing. Come on. That sounds awesome. You're weirdos. Because <laughs> you think that's bad. And we've been taught in church that's bad. This sounds awesome. This is an incredible intimate moment. And again, I always thought that Adam like was asleep and she was asleep and he wakes up and there's some hot babe in front of him and he's like, yes. <laughs> but it's so much more intimate than that. He was asleep. It's kind of like us men now while she's doing everything. We're on the couch, you know, like, and think about how amazing this is. That man was made from dirt, but woman was made from flesh. So you use that against your husband sometimes, right? Like you use that against them. This is an incredibly intimate moment where God, just as a surgeon, this is why I, I love medicine. I love, because the more we know about science and medicine, the more we're like, holy cow, this is so intricate and complex. And just like we can be organ donors where they take one organ and put it to another human so they can live, he did the first organ donation right here. And he brought them together. I love what one man goes on to say about this. <coughs> And from his rib, from his side, that means they're co-equal partners in the kingdom of God. That men are not greater than women, they're co-equal partners. And it says, she was created like, in like manner. However, the material used was more sophisticated. Amen. It was not mud, but a single rib coming from Adam. Yet the same process was followed. God took special care in creating Eve. The Bible also says God brought the first woman to her husband. So just like Adam, the first face she saw, the first voice she heard, and the first emotion she felt was not of man, but of her loving father. She was also created to have a face-to-face -face encounter with Father God. So what this means is while Adam's asleep on the couch, God met with Eve, and he says, you are my beloved daughter. I am your, your loving father. And what he was really saying, ladies, and I know that we're all caught up in sin, and don't take this in any shame or any way whatsoever. We're all messed up. What he was saying is, you should never go to a man for your worth and your acceptance because you already have it from your father. But we're all screwed up. This, this looks incredible. This looks amazing. This scene, now I hope I just enlightened you a little bit of how precious this was. Because when you were born, it was just as precious to him when you were born. 
But all we have to do is look around at the world and know that it didn't last. Something happened. Now, I don't have a ton of time to get into this, so I'm not going to, but we know something happened. And, and basically, God, Father, this is called Father, Father gave them one rule. Do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, people always ask, why did he even put the tree there? That's a great question. I believe it's because love has to have a choice. Love has to have a choice. Think about my little girl. I love my little girl, Lily, so much. And I can say to her, you get over here and you give me a hug or I'm going to spank your butt. She'll come over and do it. But it means so much more when my little girl comes to me on her own free will. Says, Daddy, I love you. You think God wants us, wants to be, yeah, you guys come worship me. You guys come love me. He's not like that. He's a father. And he respects our choices. And they screwed up. And the whole thing, again, is because they wanted knowledge more than they wanted him. And it's the same with us. We think that if we get enough science and enough medicine and enough everything, then somehow we're going to make it. And we're not making it. We're faking it. And so they go, and they, Eve eats the apple and gives it to Adam. Adam eats the apple, and they're instantly filled with shame. Instantly they knew they were naked. Instantly they felt shame. And you know what Satan actually did to them to trick them? He made them think that their, their father was not worthy to be trusted. He said to them, did God really say that? Thousands of years later, we have the book written from God, and we keep saying, did God really say that? And they said, well, there's one tree we can't eat. And he totally gets them on this spiral. And basically what he was doing was having them not trust their father. Saying, your, your, dad's, your dad's not good. Your dad's trying to hold you back. And again, in 2018, we think that God is just trying to hold us back from progress and having some fun. And they felt shame. And they went and they took creation. And they made clothes out of creation to cover their nakedness. And we're still trying to do that with the earth. Cover ourselves with the earth. If we just save the earth, if we just have the earth, whatever. That will cover us and we'll make it. And God wasn't buying it. And it says in verse 8, this is, so, this is so precious though. This is why I love believing that this story actually happened. Because it's so intimate. It says, when the cool evening breezes were blowing... The man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Hide us, earth, hide us. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? That's very important. He didn't say, what have you done? He said, where are you? I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? See, I've always thought that God was like, who told you? That you were naked. I think the father's heart is screaming out there like, oh man, who is putting this on you? I don't want you to live in shame. I don't want you to live in guilt. Who told you you're messed up? Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, I was, it was the woman you gave me. <laughs> It's so good, because it's so us. <laughs> then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And, the, and she said, the serpent deceived me. That's why I ate it. Let me break down a little lie. This whole series, I want to break down lies. Because sometimes us Christians hear another Christian or pastor say something, and we just repeat it. We don't even know if it's true. We just repeat it. And we've heard this lie that says, God can't be around sin. Father cannot be around sin. Well, right here, after the first sin, the first thing Father did was go be around sin. Instantly, he went around it. And Jesus Christ lived on this planet for 33 years around a bunch of sin. And so it says in the cool of the breeze, I believe, I actually believe that this was the moment that every day they got to worship with Father. I believe every day the Father would come at this exact time and he would meet with his kids, he would give them guidance, he would pump them up, he would tell them how much he loved them, and he comes to the garden and they're not there. Now again, we can read this as if God is like ambivalent, like he doesn't even know what's going on. Like, where are you? What have you done? He knew exactly what happened. He knew exactly what happened. And what he wanted them to do was to stop hiding behind all this fake stuff and step out and admit what they have done. And that is the hardest thing still for humans to do. But again, I want to show you a father's heart. He's not like, come out so I can get you. 
He's a father, and I think this killed him when he's like, where are you? What are you doing? Why are you hiding? Why do you have shame? Because as a father, it would kill me if my kids didn't want to be around me. If my kids didn't want to be around me, and they didn't like me, and if my kids were afraid of me, it would destroy my life, and I would do everything to make up that. And you fathers in here who might have a little strain with your kids, make up with your kids. Because you represent the father to your children. So you know what my wife and I are doing? We are pointing stuff out in each other. Because I want every sin out of my life. I want every negative thing out. So when my kids are old enough to actually really want to hang out, they want to hang out with me. They don't, I don't want my kids to say to, to each other, I hate that about dad, and I don't want to be around dad. How much more the father? As the father's sitting there and he's going like, you, you're hiding from me? You don't want to be around me? It was killing him. And so they were ashamed because of their knowledge. And that's what knowledge does. It lies to us. They instantly thought God was mad. They instantly thought their father didn't want to be around them. And so they, they try to cover themselves up with the earth. And the fascinating thing, too, is what do they do? They go and blame each other. And it's the same thing we're doing now. It's the Republicans' fault. No, it's the Democrats' fault. No, it's the Russians' fault. No, it's this fault. No, it's that fault. And I love it, right? Adam's like, well... You gave me her, so it's you and her, and she's been a pain in my side since the day you created her. That's good. You know, that's funny. And then she says, well, it was Satan. And the whole time, the father's just like, what are you guys doing? I want you to see the key verse in this is when Father came to the garden, he knew exactly what happened, and he knows every sin in your life, he knows every hurt, every pain, he knew how you grew up, he knows every lie, everything that's going on, and he didn't say to them, what have you done? He said, where are you? He wasn't there to shame them. He wasn't there to guilt them. He was saying, you are lost, and you can get lost in sin, but let me tell you, you are never more lost than when you're hiding from the Father. And he says, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Well, they wouldn't repent. Not once did we see Adam and Eve ever confess or anything. They wouldn't repent. And he had to discipline them. He kicked them out of the garden. But I love this little nugget that he gives us for all humanity before he does. He tells them that he's sending a Savior someday. Someday a Savior will come and he will fix all this. So from the very beginning, he wanted them to know that your badness will never outweigh my goodness. And it says in verse 20, Then the man, Adam, named his wife Eve, because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Again, this is so important that we see this in the right lens, because what the father does is he brings his kids before him. He brings Adam and Eve right before him, and he says, take those clothes off. Take them off. And he makes them stand there in their guilt and in their shame and in their embarrassment as their clothes are laying there. And I know, because this is how we view God. They were thinking, because sin is a stinking liar, and sin makes us just see the Father so bad. And religion makes us see the Father so terrible that we almost want the Father to go, you messed up, and now you deserve this. And he doesn't. He looks at him, and he goes over, and he kills an animal. The first death in all of history, he kills this animal, he makes clothes for them, you unique for their bodies, and he covers them. And what he was saying is, I got you covered. And no matter what sin, what pain, what hurt you're going to have out in this world, I've already covered you. And what he's really saying to them is, you feel shame, but I am not ashamed of you. I'm speaking for the Father today, and he wants you to know he is not ashamed of you hasn't liked everything you've done. He has cost his own son his life, but he is not ashamed of you. And this is all a picture of Jesus Christ. As Jesus would become the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the earth, and it says that Jesus would go to a cross naked and ashamed 
We see pictures where Jesus has a little cloth over him. No, he was naked. And what he did is he just flipped the Garden of Eden where we ate from a tree and we want knowledge and we think we're so smart and it caused death. So he went naked and ashamed, stuck on a tree so we could have life. And that is the message of the gospel. And that is the message of a father that no matter what pain or what hurt or anything you've gone through, he already says, I'm not ashamed of you and I sent the answer. Let me uniquely cover you in my righteousness and my glory because you stand perfect before your father. That's a pretty good message. We're going to show a quick video and we're going to start doing it at the beginning, but I called this series Love Dad. Not you love dad, but like he's writing you a letter. And this is what he wants you to know. And at the end, he signs it, love, dad. And then we're going to wrap this up. I was there when you were formed. I was there when you took your first breath. Your first step. Your first taste of food. It brought me great joy to create the universe. But nothing brought me more joy than creating my kids. I was there when you made your first mistake, when you wanted knowledge more than me. And I was there when you tried to hide your shame with creation. It broke my heart when our relationship was broken, but it brought me great joy to clothe your nakedness. Love, Dad. Right now, the world needs a father, and I need a father. And as I told you before, the reason I haven't preached it is I haven't felt it. For eight years of being a pastor, I've had people saying, you shouldn't act like this, you shouldn't be like this, you shouldn't preach like this, you shouldn't run a church like this, you just, you know, it's just, it's just, it's done something to me. (laughs) And you know when you're going to Bible college, I I spent $30,000 so I could say I'm a pastor to get my master's degree. And that whole time it was a waste because they didn't teach me once about who the father is. They taught me facts. They taught me a lot of theology. They taught me all this other stuff, but not once did they tell me that my father is amazing. And I've had religious people constantly saying, you shouldn't be this, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, and it made me have this bad view of the father. And I want to thank those religious people now because all it's done is push me deeper and deeper into the father's love to understand who he is. And I feel it now, and I'm free. I am who I am. And I'm a unique son of God, the same way you are a unique son of God and a unique daughter of God. And he is well pleased with me. And he is well pleased with you. And may I say this to you Christians in here. It's time we stop telling everybody what the father demands and start telling them who the father is. Because we're going to be religious. And we're going to, you think that we're not immune to the, the, the church's past where they just become this religious thing and they put shame and guilt on people? Or we become nationalistic. It's all about America. Just America, 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 America. Because we're totally lost on who the Father is. We are kingdom people. And we are here to tell the world who our daddy is. Band, you can come on up. I love this scene. Love it. Right after the resurrection. So what Kyle preached on last week. Right after the resurrection. The disciples went and hid. Because they were afraid. They were afraid of the Jews. And they were afraid that they let Jesus down because while Jesus was being crucified, they all ran for their own life. And so they go and they hide in this room and it says that Jesus went to them. Jesus went to them. And I love that just like in the garden when God, the Father, instantly goes to them while they are hiding, Jesus does too. And listen to what he says to them. It says, Jesus repeated his greeting, peace to you. And he told them, just as the Father has sent me, I'm now sending you. 
Then taking a deep breath, he blew on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. I send you to preach the forgiveness of sins. Now stop and listen to that. I see, you're, if you're a Christian in here, he's saying, I send you to preach the rebuking of people. I send you to preach shame. I want you to go take out all the gay people. I want you to go take out all the Democrats and Republicans. He says, I want you to go preach forgiveness. And people's sins will be forgiven. But if you don't proclaim the forgiveness of their sins, they will remain guilty. This is what our life is all about. This is everything we should be about as Christians. Because if you really see now that I've told you about the Father's heart, we've read this before as him saying like, they're gonna remain guilty. But if you know the Father's heart, he's like, please go tell people. They're already forgiven. Not that they have to do something, not that they need to say a bunch of religious things, not that they have to take communion, not that they have to do all this stuff, that it's already done and that you proclaim forgiveness over people. And so if you are in here today, I'm not here to tell you you're a sinner. You prove that every day of your life. I'm here to tell you you're already forgiven. Changes everything. Because the father is sitting there like, if you don't do this, they're going to remain guilty. And they're going to feel shame. And they're going to feel sadness. And I don't want my kids feeling those things. So go tell them about the forgiveness of God. And when you see it that way, it changes everything about who our father is. Today, we're going to have a prayer team up here. If you need to just get prayed over, that's great. If you just need something in your life, or if you just need to confess that you've looked at dad wrong, or you can come up and you can give your life to the Lord and receive what's already there. I proclaim God's forgiveness over your life. I proclaim that you are forgiven. You just need to see God as awesome and take off this stupid man-made stuff to somehow appease the Father because you stand naked before your Father and he says, I am not ashamed of you because of what my son did on the cross 2,000 years ago. We also got a bunch of water over here. <laughs> this is what baptism is. Baptism is saying that I am taking off this robe of religion, I am taking off this shame, I'm taking off this guilt, and I'm ready to be clothed in God's righteousness. It's an act of receiving what Father has already done for you. And we have a change of clothes for you. We have extra shirts, we got extra sweatpants, so we don't want you coming in here naked. <laughs> That'd be great symbolism for this sermon. But this is a way of saying you receive what Father has done for you. And that he loves you, that he forgives you, that he's for you, that he's not ashamed of you, and he's ready for you to come home and have fellowship with him. Do this, do this, you guys. Because he's not ashamed of you. Do not be ashamed of him and start this whole new life. And all it is, when you get in that water, it's just the Father embracing you and saying, welcome home, my kid.